Thank you. It's good to be here and Happy New Year to you. Uh, this is my apple for this year. And Dow Jones has gone over 24, uh, 25,000 and I'm used to a big juicy red apple. But this is a reminder that we need to always stay humble because we never know. I appreciate you uh, coming. And if we'd had this study last week, it would have been a winter Bible study. This week, it is a January Bible study because winter is gone. I know some of you are thinking, well, you must be crazy. It's cold out there to me, but it's not freezing. And so uh, we're not going to have any more freezing weather for the next three days. Anyway, I was, uh, I was sort of disappointed about the fish fry tomorrow night because I couldn't think of anything else going on tomorrow night. That, you know, but uh, uh, for those of you that just might be casual football fans, uh, tomorrow night I will stop at uh, as close to eight o'clock. Might even be a little bit before. Um, I mean, I will I will be sensitive to to this. Uh, to be honest with you, this is more important than the football game. But that's hard to convince people who are paying $2,200 a ticket uh, to go to it. But I'm just saying in eternity, uh, it's going to matter more about what you did with the Bible than what happened at the football game. But I have also learned that you can't, you know, there's some, you have to choose your battles. And, and, and so what we're going to do is one hour from right now, tonight, and... Close to 8 o'clock tomorrow night. No, we won't go after 8. Give you time if you really want to rush home and be there for the kickoff. Uh, Tuesday night and Wednesday night, we may have to double up, have two sessions, because First Peter is not that long. It's five chapters. Last year we had four in Malachi. We're going up a chapter a year. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot of stuff here, and... So possibly Tuesday and Wednesday night we'll need to double up. But my, tonight, in fact, I have my official watch here. I have 644. I'm going to leave this watch right here. If it's not here tomorrow night, I can't make any promises. <laughs> but I'm going to leave this watch, and I'm going to call the 911 when I leave the church and see if the sheriff's department will ride by and uh, keep an eye on this watch until uh, tomorrow night. Because if I take it home, I'm going to forget it. So I'm going to leave it right here. And uh, if you'll turn, please, to 1 Peter. We'll begin our study tonight. You possibly received an outline when you came in. The outline is not necessarily essential, but just to give you a visual reminder that we did have Bible study this year. Because if y'all's memory is not any better than mine, in a few weeks, you'll wonder, did we have January Bible study? You know, the time is gone, but uh, we're going to try to have it. First Peter, I'd like to do a little introductory uh, things for you tonight. Oh, by the way, we need to leave here at 7. I need to quit about 740. Okay, so I'll try to keep an eye on this clock. One eye on you and one eye on this clock. Uh, and I... Again, I appreciate being at Mount Vernon. I looked y'all up again today on, uh, on the internet just to make sure I would be streaming tonight and going live to the nation. So I, I feel like I ought to say something important uh, since I have this opportunity here at Mount Vernon. Mount Vernon is so specialized, and y'all are the first church I've noticed to do this. You have a cell phone section and a non-cell phone section. This side over here has got Wi-Fi, and this side over here doesn't even have a cell phone. So I appreciate, you know, how y'all have divided up so that we won't get on each other's nerves. Uh, and, of course, the National Weather Service uh, had posted for customers going to Walmart that they wear two pair of pajamas. When they went to Walmart, it was so cold. <laughs> but that has been lifted. Uh, as of tonight at 6 o'clock, they lifted that. So you can go back to one pair of pajamas now when you go to shopping at Walmart. All right, 1 Peter chapter 1. The first thing is the author of the book. 
And that is obvious. That's like asking who's buried in Grant's tomb, isn't it? Obviously, it is Peter. Uh, he was, of course, one of Jesus' disciples, and, and not only a disciple, he was one of the, the uh, three that we call the inner circle that Jesus had. Now, Peter was a fisherman before he became a follower of Jesus. And he is known by some as the unlearned and ignorant fisherman. However, no one who has spent three years with Jesus can be called unlearned or ignorant. But Acts 4.13, they called Peter and John that. They said they were unlearned and ignorant. All it means is they were not professionals in the area of religion. In other words, they had not been to seminary and, and all that stuff that we think of today. You know, they, they were just guys that, that God liked to use and, and uh, his name, uh, uh, God changed his name to Peter, which is a rock. His original name was Simon, but uh, Peter means a rock. But now be aware that it took Peter three years to become a rock. And, you know, we tend to think that how can I become an instant, overnight disciple, just, just become instantly uh, spiritual. Uh, it's a hard, I'm telling you, it's a battle. And it took Jesus three years to make Peter into what he was. So if you're not what you think you should be spiritually, don't give up because the Lord is still working on us and there's still hope for us. We're here. There's still hope that God will use us. Uh, so Simon Peter, and of course he wrote uh, Second Peter as well, but we're, we're looking at First Peter this week. Remember these Bible studies are chosen by Lifeway, the part of the Southern Baptist Convention. Uh, I don't choose the study, um, but First Peter is a good book. It's uh, got some difficult parts, and if you think Peter is unlearned and ignorant, we're about in just a few moments to dive into some of the deepest theological material in the New Testament. He's going to talk about election, sanctification, salvation, the Trinity, uh, you know, just stuff that's very, very complicated to the average person. So the author is uh, Simon Peter. Now, I think, I don't have an outline up here, so what did I put next? The date? The time, okay, was probably around uh, 64 to 65 A.D., A.D., after the birth of Christ, around 64, 65. Um, we don't have to know that, but it uh, just gives us an idea. And, and I'll say this again before the week's over, but in the year 64, uh, the Roman Empire got a new emperor named Nero, and Nero was a, a bitter hater of Christians and so there's going to be some major persecution coming for the church in that time and Peter was writing and in fact I think that's one of the reasons he wrote was uh, to, to try to encourage these people because he knew that Nero uh, Nero in our in our way of thinking was a mental case but uh, he, he's going to be bitterly persecuting Christians now you might say well how can I relate to that? Because we live in the good old United States and we have religious freedom. Well, we don't have as much as you think. Uh, our freedom is, and our freedom is constantly under attack. You need to be aware of that. And the devil's crowd's not giving up. Uh, we, we're in a, and just because Donald Trump was elected president and Donald Trump supposedly has prayer meetings every week, and I do appreciate uh, some of the things that he has said, you know, and he's, uh, he's actually been more pro, and, and I don't know if he's saved or not. I hope he is. He claims to be. I don't know. But I'm just saying, uh, even with him as president, you might think, well, we can all relax. Uh, apparently, that's what the Republican Party has thought, but they're going to find out different when the elections come around this year. Uh, things are going to get rough in this country, and we might think they're bad now, but we are a divided country, and uh, America desperately needs unity, not division, just like a church would need that. But anyway, the timing here is um, around the time that some severe persecution is about to take place. Uh, the, the church wasn't popular anyway, but 
uh, you know, as long as the church was small and not that big, the, most of the Roman Empire uh, just more or less ignored it. But now they're going to begin a crackdown on them. So that's the time or the date. I don't know what word I used. The next word I probably talked about was the place that where he wrote the letter. And would you believe this is one of the most debated parts of 1 Peter? In 1 Peter 5, 13, which is the next to last verse in the, in the uh, book, it says he was uh, writing from Babylon. But uh, that has been debated. Uh, it's very controversial. And I would assume that most of you could care less. If he wrote it from Kayville, it doesn't change anything. It's still God's word. But there is a debate about it. But I think I'll save that for Wednesday night because I don't want to get bogged down on, on the non-essentials uh, tonight. And then uh, did I put the uh, all right, author, date, place, theme? All right, the theme is Christians can have hope in time of suffering. In fact, I, I think I might have entitled this from grace uh, to glory, but uh, Christians can have hope in time of suffering. I appreciate that, my good man. Uh, so it lets us know one of the things he's going to talk about quite a bit in the book is suffering. We don't like to hear about that. We would much rather hear positive things because that's the thing now in America that religion has gone to is the positive outlook. You know, let's be, let's don't ever say anything negative. Let's make people feel good when they come to church and all of that. But you, when you read your Bible, you're going to get a different story that, uh, that never promised us that we'd have it easy. So Peter's going to talk a lot about suffering. But the theme of the book is that we can have hope in time of suffering. So don't give up. Now, I did not put this on the outline, and I don't know why. It's the key verse. So y'all can put that as what, D, if you wanted to, or uh, the key verse, and this is my opinion, is 1 Peter 5, 7. It's the most beautiful verse in the, in the letter. And it says this, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. For all of us tonight that are battling with discouragement, maybe things are not well in, in your private life, things just aren't going well maybe. The Bible says you can cast all your care upon him because he cares for you. That's, to me, the key verse. All right, beginning in chapter 1, chapter 1 has 25 verses. I had a goal to do chapter 1 tonight, chapter 2 tomorrow night, and then do the best we can Tuesday and Wednesday night. See, y'all are always the guinea pigs because I always start the Bible study at Mount Vernon. It's not like I did this last week and I've got all this planned out, you know, just to know where to stop and how far to go. I, I don't know. But I know we've got to cover five chapters in four nights and that doesn't come out right in fractions, you know. Uh, you do know that four-fifths of the people in this country have trouble with fractions. But anyway, uh, only Ansley would get that one. The rest of you, uh, we don't have time to explain. But... Let's begin here, chapter 1, verse 1. Um, I think I, well, I don't know. This is still part of the introduction, I guess. All right, verse 1, Peter. Now, first word tells us who wrote it. Now, if you write a letter to someone, which you would never do because they don't even teach cursive anymore, I don't guess, in school, and I don't guess we'll ever get another letter. But we get emails and Snapchats and everything else, you know, and Apple Jacks and all this stuff that's on the internet. But in Bible times, you would sign your name at the beginning of your letter, then write the letter. In olden days, we would write letters and then sign our name at the end. But they did it at the beginning, and the reason was that they wrote like on a scroll. And so when you unroll the scroll, if you don't put your name first, you have to unroll the whole thing to figure out who wrote this. So they would always put their name first. So Peter, and remember his name means what? Rock. Very good. No wonder you're on the front seat. See, if everybody sit on the front seat, y'all know all this stuff. All right? Peter, an apostle. 
Now, an apostle means one sent from God. And according to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 1, Paul says, To be an apostle, you had to be an eyewitness of the resurrected Christ. Well, now that one's easy. Peter's obviously no problem here. We can check him off. He was an eyewitness of the resurrected Christ. But based on that definition, there is no one today that can call themselves an apostle. I know some people do, especially in some of our other churches. Uh, some people call themselves an apostle, but that's not worth it even talking about because there, nobody around today has seen the resurrected Christ. Um, nobody's that old. So uh, there are no apostles today biblically. You might, somebody might call themselves an apostle, but it means nothing. Now, but notice that Peter just simply identifies himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ. He doesn't say that I was the main apostle. I was the number one apostle. I was one of the inner circle along with James and John. He just says an apostle. Uh, we do not accept as Baptists the idea that Peter was a pope or that he was somehow the first leader. In fact, if you'll read the book of Acts, you'll find that in the early church, Jesus' half-brother James was, was the head of the, of the church, not even Peter. And Peter never claims to be the head of the church. Uh, but anyway, he says, An apostle of Jesus Christ to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Gal Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia. Those names don't mean anything to us. But what the, when it says strangers here, that word means exiles. These five areas that he named in verse 1 were all located in modern-day Turkey. It just simply means they were people who were Jews who had, were not living in the promised land. They were not in Palestine. They were not in what we call Israel today. They had been scattered. But that's all he means. Okay? So just understand that he's writing to fellow Jews but to Jews who have been scattered. Now, I wish you hadn't started this in verse 2, but we come to one of the most controversial parts of the, of the letter right here in verse 2 in talking about election. Uh, I saw a cute outline of this. I, I, I should have used it probably. Uh, somebody uh, had an outline on 1 Peter. It said, an election that cannot be lost. I like that, an election that cannot be lost. But he begins by using the word elect. Now any time a preacher starts talking about the elect, you can rest assured there'll be confusion in the audience. The reason is that that word elect has caused a lot of division in the church. Now I hope you all will hear all of this. Election is taught in the Bible but some people take it to an extreme. They're called hyper-Calvinist. And they take it to an extreme and they say that God has already chosen who will be saved and who will be lost. It's already predestined as to who will be saved and who will be... In other words, let me rephrase it. According to that belief, some people are predestined to go to heaven and some people are predestined to go to hell. All right, that's the extreme. And, and there are people who believe that that are in our churches. Y'all might think, well, you know, nobody, you know, they are. They're here. Uh, and then there's, that, that's one extreme, that God has already chosen and, and, and even if you wanted to be saved, if you're not part of the elect, you can't be saved. See, I can't, I can't go that far. Uh, then, there's, then there's another group that goes completely to the other direction, and they say everything is based on free will, that man's free will is what determines uh, whether, you know, your salvation and all. But if you go to the extreme with free will, then you have to say, I don't know for sure that I'm going to make it to heaven. I just have to do the, you know, I have to hold out and do the best I can. And, and I'll, see, I'm not comfortable with either one of them. To me, the truth is somewhere in the middle. Now, 
let's ask it this way. Does God know in advance who's going to be saved? Absolutely. Absolutely. If somebody walked down the aisle this morning at this church and asked Jesus into their heart, do you think God didn't know about it yesterday? Do you think God doesn't already know the final score of tomorrow night's game? He already knows. I don't think he cares, but he already knows. Uh, it's us that care. But, you see, God, in order to be God, has to know the future. So he knows. And the Bible, no matter what we call them, uh, refer, those who have accepted Christ are called the elect. But see, I don't know who they are. God has not sent me a fax with the names of all the people in Jeff Davis County that, have, that are going to be saved. If he did, that would make it a lot easier because I wouldn't have to worry about trying to talk to people you know, that weren't interested. You could just go to the ones and you'd have 100% uh, success rate because everybody you talked to would be saved. God already knows but now I do not believe that Jesus just died for a handful of people and that God is, has already chosen that some people are going to go to hell in spite of whatever they do, that they can't be saved. See, the Bible teaches both. Somebody asked Charles Spurgeon one time, he said, how do you reconcile election and free will? And Spurgeon's answer was a classic. He said, I don't ever try to reconcile friends. The Bible teaches both. For example, by the way, this has been debated for hundreds of years. Don't think we're going to settle it here at Mount Vernon tonight. They're the greatest minds in history have studied this stuff. The Bible teaches election. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4 says, We were chosen in Him before the foundation of the world. All right? Before God ever made this world, He knew that you would be saved. See, if you are saved, He knew that. You didn't surprise God the day you walked down the aisle at the church and asked Christ into your heart. God didn't say, wow, I didn't know they were going to. See, he'd already know. However, Romans 10, 13 says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. All right, that's free will. Whoever, whoever shall call. It doesn't say the ones that are chosen can call, but whoever shall call. But, since I have a special affinity for y'all, I'm going to show you a verse in the Bible that has both of them in the same verse. Now, what I'm saying is, we don't need to argue about this stuff. Both of them are true. But everybody I've ever met that believes in election believe they were part of the elect. I have never met one person who believed they were predestined to go to hell. Everybody I've ever met that believed in election believed they were part of the elect. In other words, it's sort of a spiritual snobbery. You know, I've got it, too bad you don't. You know, I'm one of the elect, too bad you're not. All right, hold your place in 1 Peter. I don't normally do this, but this verse will eat your lunch for you. John chapter 6. John chapter 6 and verse 37. Next time you're at the Huddle House and the argument's going on about you know, election and, and all that stuff. Look at, take your Bible in there and look at this verse. John 6, 37. It's going to be in red letters if you have a red letter Bible. Meaning it is the words of Jesus. Watch this. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. Okay, that's election. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. 100%. But notice the rest of the verse. And to him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. That's free will. So you got them both in the same verse. So we'll just move on. I don't like to even argue about this kind of stuff because they're both true. But you can go to an extreme, see. And I don't like to be an extreme on, on this because if you're, if you're a Calvinist, you're accepting the teachings of John Calvin. Well, who was John Calvin? Why is he so smart? You better accept the teachings of Jesus Christ. Now, if you say you're not a Calvinist, they say, well, are you an Armenian? All right, that's the opposite. No, I'm not an Armenian either. Uh, let's just stay with the Bible, okay? The Bible teaches both. If you start following a human leader, how are you going to know he's got it right? 
You better stay with the Bible now. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Now, does God know in advance? Obviously, He does. God knows who will be here tomorrow night. Some of you think that y'all are going to sneak out tomorrow night and catch the pregame festivities. And uh, me and Brother Daryl can already tell you, they're going to tell you the same thing tomorrow night they've told you for the last week. Not anything new going to happen in the pregame. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Okay, God knows in advance who will be saved. But he offers to whosoever will can come. And if you don't make it to heaven, it won't be because God chose you to be lost. It'll be because you rejected the only way to heaven, which is Jesus. Through sanctification of the Spirit, there again is a big word that we sort of intimidates us, and that's the word sanctification. It just means to be set apart. The Holy Spirit does the same. If we live a holy life, it is not because we are good people. It's because the Holy Spirit sets us apart. And then he says... Uh, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, now notice, dear, you've got the Father and the Spirit and the Son in one verse. Even though the word Trinity is not in the Bible, the idea of the Trinity is in the Bible because uh, as far as God the Father was concerned, I was saved before he created this world. As far as God the Son was concerned, I was saved when he died on the cross. But as far as the Holy Spirit was concerned, I was saved when I was a senior in high school. And I won't tell you all what year that was. But uh, some of you went to school with me, so you know anyway. But uh, it takes all three of them to save us. That's what I'm getting at. And Peter is, see, and, and we call him an unlearned fisherman. Well, he's dealing with stuff that theologians battle about. And then he says, grace unto you in peace. Now that sounds like Paul, doesn't it? Remember, this is Peter. And I might accidentally say Paul this week sometime because we're so used to studying Paul's letters, but grace and peace are in the right order. You can't have peace without grace, the unmerited favor of God. Then he says in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed in the, uh, in the Sermon on the Mount means happy. Remember the, the uh, Beatitudes? But that's not what the word means here. It's a different Greek word here. Here it means thankful or to give thanks. Did you know our English word eulogy comes from this word here? It's the derivative of this word for blessed. Uh, when you go to a funeral and somebody eulogizes somebody, you know what they do? They talk about their good stuff. All right. Thankful to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us. Begotten means to be born again. Jesus said to Nicodemus in John 3, 7, uh, you must be born again. If anyone here is going to make it to heaven, you must be born a second time. You had a fleshly birth. You've got that, it's on your driver's license, social security card, whatever. But you've got to have a second birth. All right, that, but whatever you say, it's the word begotten. It means born again, begotten. Unto a lively hope, that means a living hope. I didn't realize when I was 17 years old and uh, walk down the aisle at Consolation Baptist Church. Uh, I didn't understand all this stuff about the future, but my salvation is more important now than it was then because I have a living hope. A lot of hopes as you get older, and a lot of you here tonight I've known for a long, long time. And the sad thing about life is as we get older, we lose a lot of our dreams and goals. But I have one hope that I haven't lost and that's that I'm going to be with Jesus one day a living hope everything else you know your hope will vanish but you, but you have a living hope and, and that hope is made possible by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead 
And that is so important. We only talk about it once a year at Easter. Easter, sadly, this year is going to be on April 1st. What a terrible day to have Easter. But it is because of the resurrection that we have a hope. Verse 4, he talks about our inheritance. So we're in the will. If you got an inheritance, you're in the will, right? Our inheritance is incorruptible. That means it'll last forever. Our bodies are corruptible. They'll decay in the graveyard. But our inheritance is incorruptible. Our inheritance is undefiled. Means nothing will ever stain it. That city to where we're going to, the Bible says they will not bring into that city uh, things that will defile it. Revelation 21, 27, nothing shall enter into that city that will defile it. There'll be no gambling halls, pornography, X-rated movies, drugs, you know, all, uh, all that kind of stuff in the city where we're going. It's going to be undefiled. I mean, this is good stuff now. I hope I find me a black church on the way home. I'm going to go in and see if they need a speaker because y'all aren't getting this. You've got something that will last forever, that can't be stained, and then he says it fades not away. Everything man builds will fade away. The hanging gardens of Babylon, built by Nebuchadnezzar, one of the world's great wonders. Solomon's temple, one of the great architectural things of all time. They're gone. Everything man builds fades away. But our inheritance, this is part of a section to me that I, 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 it's one of the things that makes me a Baptist. I believe in eternal security. Everybody doesn't. Everybody, every Baptist doesn't, but I don't know why you don't. To an inheritance, he says, it fades not away. Reserved, there it is. Reserved means that it is kept. I wonder who's keeping it. Our salvation is reserved. You ever been to a motel and had thought you had reservations and when you got there, there was been some confusion and you, <laughs> you ended up staying at Motel 6? All right. But we have a reservation that cannot be canceled. I'd like for somebody that doesn't believe in eternal security to show me how our reservation is going to be canceled. When it's guarded by the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they've got an eye on it. Verse 5, he says, who are kept, there it is, by the power of God. I used to have some friends, they're gone now, I've outlived them, that used to, when they'd come up to see me, they'd say, pray for me that I'll hold out faithful to the end. A lot of people have that idea. If I don't hold out faithful, I might lose this salvation that I've got. Oh, folks, you can't lose this. It is kept. The same God that saves you keeps you. I mean, that, this is so clear. I just don't understand why, why people can't, accept, can't understand that. For, uh, Philippians 1, 6 says, He that has begun a good work in you will perform it into the day of Jesus Christ. To put it in our language, God finishes what he starts. We are kept by the power of God not by our good works. Verse 6, wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you're in heaviness through manifold temptations. That word temptations means trials. Everyone in this building is going to have some bad days sooner or later. And nobody going to go through this life and everything go right. We're all going to have troubles. But he says we're to rejoice. That's what the Bible says. I didn't say I'd always did it. I'm telling you what the Bible says. That we're to rejoice. And one reason is that our troubles are just for a season. What are y'all worried about tonight? We don't have time to call you up to the microphone here one by one and say what you're worried about. But I want to ask you this question. What were you worried about this week last year? 
I can't remember. Can y'all? I'm sure I was worried about something, but I can't remember now what it was. But uh, Brother Darrell, about this time last year, you had your knee problems, wasn't it? So we sort of know what you were worried about then, but it's for a season. See, the man's as good as new. Uh, well, close. All right. For a season. It's like the old black fellow that somebody asked him what was his favorite verse in the Bible, and he said, it came to pass. And what he meant was, you know, your troubles will pass. Now, there may be new troubles. I figured out that if one thing gets solved, I just worry about something else. But I know I don't have the faith that y'all have. So for a season, manifold here means multicolored. It means that somebody over here is worried about cancer. Somebody over here is worried about high blood pressure. Somebody over here is worried about their marriage. Somebody over here is worried about their financial. In other words, we have different kinds of trials. But they last only for a season. And when we get to heaven... I think we'll be embarrassed that we spent so much time worrying about stuff that in, in, in light of eternity doesn't amount, doesn't amount to anything. Verse 7, the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire. That's a term that's going to come up again in the book, so I'll save that for right now. Uh, trying, being tried with fire might be found unto praise and glory and honor at the appearing of Jesus Christ. He says it's more precious than, than gold that's tried with fire. And, and I've been over this with y'all before, but the goldsmith would take gold and they put it like in a heated furnace or something, and they burn it, uh, not to destroy it, but to purify it, and, they, and it burns off the dross, and, and the gold becomes more valuable. Uh, in fact, I'll just tell you this, this is my opinion. I believe that the most godly member of Mount Vernon Baptist Church is the person who has been through the most trials. We don't become strong by everything being easy. We like it that way, but that doesn't develop us. But it's the ones who've been through the most. Verse 8, whom having not seen, ye love. Now how is that possible? To love somebody you have never seen. The only way it's possible is the Holy Spirit makes Jesus so real to us. I have never seen Jesus of you. Not in a physical. You know, I've seen pictures. We don't know what those pictures were based on artists of the Middle Ages. But uh, he is. I love him because the Holy Spirit makes him real. Verse 9, receiving the end of your faith even the salvation of your souls. Now what's happened to us, all of you here in this building that have accepted Jesus as your Savior, you, your soul, has been saved, but your body hasn't. You've got a saved soul and an unsaved body. And there'll be conflict. That, that in itself is going to create conflict. Now when we're going to get our new body at the rapture of the church, that's one purpose for the rapture, we're going to get a new body. Verses 10 and 11, we can run together of which salvation the prophets. Now he's talking about the Old Testament prophets, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Jeremiah. These guys have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of that grace that should come unto you. Searching what or with what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified before. Well, let me, before I go any further, I must tell you this. Did you see that? These prophets in the Old Testament, when they wrote their prophecies, the Spirit of Christ was in them. See, the Holy Spirit did not indwell people in the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit moved on people. But when they were writing God's Word, the Holy Spirit was helping them so that there's no error. That's the difference now between the Bible and any other book. There's no, the Holy Spirit uh, inspired them and to what words to use. Now, we may not understand all the Bible, but I guarantee you it's all true. All of it. Inerrant. Infallible. All right. Then it talks about the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. See, here's the problem. There's nothing wrong with the Old Testament. 
It's just that the Old Testament uh, the New Testament gives us more light or more revelation or makes it clearer. But there's nothing wrong with the Old Testament. But the Old Testament prophets were confused. They knew that there was a Messiah coming. Now they didn't know his name would be called Jesus, but they knew that he was coming. But they talked about here the sufferings and his glory. Now how could both of those be true? See, on, on the one hand, you can read in the Old Testament, they'll talk about the sufferings that the Messiah will have. And then you can read in another passage about the glory of the Messiah's kingdom. And which one's right? They both are. But if me and you had been living in Old Testament times, we couldn't have figured that out. In fact, some people even thought there would be two Messiahs, one to suffer and one to reign. You know, in other words, how could, how could one do both? And let me show you what I'm talking about. If you'll read Isaiah chapter 53, you will find that entire chapter is talking about the suffering substitute. But if you read Isaiah chapter 11, same writer now, Isaiah chapter 11, it talks about the glorious kingdom that he's going to have in which the lamb, lamb will lie down with the wolf. Y'all thought I was going to say lion, didn't you? That's what Elvis sang. That comes from peace in the valley. Now the Bible says the lamb will lie down with the wolf. Or it actually says the wolf will lie down with the lamb. But it doesn't matter because the animal kingdom. Uh, it, and it talks about they're going to beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. And there will be a thousand glorious years in which Jesus will reign from Jerusalem. We better get our embassy there. That's where Jesus is going to reign from. He ain't going to reign from Tel Aviv. All right. But see... We can look back and see how both of those related to Jesus. We can look back at his sufferings on the cross. We look ahead to the glory when he sets up his kingdom. We're sort of living in between. Likewise, there's a whole bunch of stuff about his second coming and the battle of Armageddon and all that. And I think we have trouble trying to put all the pieces together. We have most of the pieces, but we're not sure we got them all together in the right order and, and all of that. And I'll tell you, we need to pray for this Iranian stuff. If the people in Iran, 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 whatever, they're in the streets tonight protesting their government. And the news media is as silent as a church mouse. And uh, all the women that are supposedly marching for women's rights in this country, they're not saying a word. Hypocrites. All right, we bet if Iran could turn around and have an overthrow of that government, I would think that we might have a few more years before the Lord comes. But if not, I see much trouble very quickly to come in this world. We're moving quickly towards Armageddon. I'm afraid it's not going to be turned around, but there is hope. There's a little hope. If we would get behind it, if our media would, get, would be as excited about the people in Iran who want their freedom and out in the street, some of them being killed, if our media was as concerned about that as they are all this stupid Russian mess, uh, the Iranians would have already overthrown that government. Moving on. Verse 12. He talks about our salvation. I'm going to try to save time now. I'm going to have to hurry up a little bit. But he says in the latter part of verse 12 that the angels desire to look into. See, the angels made a choice before this world was created. There was a rebellion in heaven. And some of them followed Lucifer. And some of them stayed with God. But the good angels, God's angels, they're looking into, they're just fascinated by our salvation. Because see, as far as I know, there is no plan of salvation for the angels. They've already made their choice. In other words, Brother Darrell or myself or nobody else is going to ever preach to angels. They've already made their choice. But they're looking at our salvation and, and they're just amazed that we can be saved by grace. And I had somebody out at Midway tell me uh, that it might be that they're looking at our salvation and they're wondering why, why everybody doesn't accept it. Why wouldn't you want to go to heaven? It's a free gift. I know that's redundant because any gift is free, but 
uh, it's, a, it's a absolutely paid for. Why would you not want to go to heaven? The angels can't figure it out. They're just looking, you know, at us and wondering, why, why are we so dense? You know, why, why do we have to beg people to be saved? Why would you have to beg somebody to go to heaven? Verse 13 talks about uh, living clean in a perverted world. It's a little bit different section here. Wherefore, that lets us know the sort of change here in his thoughts. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Gird up here gives the idea of uh, let's get with it. Hadn't you heard people say that before? Let's get with it. You know, we're just dragging around. Gird up. Now, now you're to gird up is the idea here. The, the idea in Hebrew or Greek is of a robed person. See, in Bible days, they wore these long robes, tying that robe and stuffing it under their belt so they can be free to run. Because if you stake off running with that robe, you're going to trip over it and hurt yourself. But you, you tie it up. You gird it up. So what he's saying here is we need to have a disciplined mind. How's your mind doing? I don't do much bad stuff anymore, but my mind's messed up. <laughs> I have trouble sometimes with my thoughts. Gird up your mind. Then he says, be sober. And here, it doesn't mean the absence of drink, but it means to be serious. Be, be serious-minded. Be sober-minded. Take this seriously. And uh, hope to the end, that means to have an optimistic mind. Now, I'll be honest, I don't have one. I always see the negative and stuff, but my dad was negative, my mother was negative. I got a double negative when I was born. And they used to, when I took pictures with the camera, develop the negatives. I'm just a negative person, you know. Like I say, I look for stuff to worry about. I know that's a sin. You don't have to, you don't have to Facebook me tonight and say, hey, that's a sin, isn't it, to worry? Yes, it is. Yes, it is, but I'm not perfect, are you? See, where I worry, you might do something else, uh, but we're all messed up, and we need grace. Hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, when he says hope to the end, uh, I had a fellow at First Baptist told me, he said, I don't, I'm not interested in all this prophecy stuff like you are. He said, I just know it's all going to work out. Well... Yeah, it is going to work out. But I want to know how it's going to work out. And how is it going to work out? Through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Not with the election of the Republican Party or Donald Trump even or, or anybody else. It's going to work out through the, when Jesus comes. Verses 14 and 15. As obedient children... Shouldn't children have the same character of their parents? All you school teachers here, help me out for a minute. I need a witness. Do you have problems with your children at school? When they have PTA nights and the parents come, can you figure it out then why the children are messed up? Yes, amen. That's a witness. If you see the parents, you'll know why the children are the way they are. All right? That's the first witness I've had at this church in 37 years. And I started not to come. As obedient children, in other words, as God is, we ought to resemble him in some respects. And I don't mean physically because we don't know what God looks like. But we ought, to, we ought to, as the world sees us, they ought to say, well, that's what a Christian looks like. As obedient children. Not fashioning yourselves according to your former lust and your ignorance. You know what he's saying there? Before we were saved, we were ignorant. And that's exactly right. In fact, I look back at my life and I think I was mentally off. I don't think a psychiatrist would have diagnosed it. But I was crazy. You know, I wanted to be like the older boys that got in trouble on the bus and talked back to the teachers and, you know, did, and I was just ignorant. I mean, I, I, I'm serious about this now. I cut up a lot, but I, I just wish my old bus driver was still alive. I'd go apologize to him. I have thought many times about how ugly I was to my bus driver. That's why I often say there ought to be a special place in heaven 
for school bus drivers and substitute teachers because they don't get no respect. But the teacher don't even get respect, much less the substitute. Uh, I could say more there, but I'm going to move on. I'm going to move on. He says, verse 15, But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Now, can we be as holy as God? Let's be honest, no. But we ought to resemble Him in some ways. We need to be holy. That word conversation, by the way, it's going to come up again about Tuesday night probably, means more. We, we think of conversation as like, let's talk after church. Let's have a conversation. That's not what it means in the Bible. It means your lifestyle. We need to be holy in our lifestyle. Verse 16, because it is written. Now, anytime you see that in the New Testament, where it says, it is written, you know it is referring back to somewhere in the Old Testament. Your job as Bible detectives is to figure out what verse in the Old Testament is he talking about. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. Where's that at in the Old Testament? Well, we don't have time to call you up. It's Leviticus chapter 11, verse 44. But any time you see that, you know he's referring, he's quoting from the Old Testament. Be ye holy, for I am holy. Holy, we're to be separated from the world uh, as best we can from the evils of the world. Verse 17. And if you call on the Father who without respect of persons, how many of you know that, that God has no respect of persons? You see, if, if some famous, if, if Franklin Graham walked in here tonight, I love Franklin Graham. I respect him. He's probably the most respected preacher to me in this country. Uh, but we would probably make a buzz after church to, to see him or get his autograph or to be photographed with him or, or whatever. But God has no respect of persons. God loves us, me and you, as much as he does Billy Graham. Now I know some of you are thinking, well that's hard to believe. Because Billy Graham's preached to 200, over 200 countries. Millions of people have been saved in his preaching. And I, all I do is teach a lowly Sunday school class or, you know, play with the kids in the gym or something. But if you're a child of God, you're one of his children. And God has no respect of persons. Now, I learned that the hard way years ago because I thought I could get away with something because I was a preacher. You can't. God, in fact, he holds us to even higher standards, really. I heard Charles Stanley telling me that one day on TV. It was just like he was speaking to me. It was obviously the Holy Spirit. If I'd have listened, I'd have been saved a lot of trouble. But I didn't pay no attention to Charles Stanley. I thought I could do it my way, but I found out Charles Stanley was right. I listen to him now. All right, he says, without respect of persons. Judgeth according to every man's work. What judgment is he talking about there? He's talking about the judgment seat of Christ. If you want to know more information, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 11 to 15. Romans chapter 14, verses 10 to 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. If I go too fast on any of these, you can always see me after church. Uh, but there is a judgment. We're not going to be judged now for our sins if we're saved. Our sins are under the blood of Jesus. But what have we done since we were saved? That's our works. That's what's going to be judged. Not our sins. They've been forgiven. But what we have done for the Lord since we were saved. And so he says that we're to pass the time of our sojourning here in fear. Fear doesn't mean that we're all to wake up every morning just scared to get out of bed afraid like I used to be before I went to school you know I was afraid to go afraid to go to the classroom I knew that something would be wrong that's not the kind of fear he's talking about he's talking about respect reverence now that word sojourning means that we're just passing through the old song says this world is not my home I'm just a passing through see a lot of folks have invested a lot of money in Appling County 
Some people have got beautiful homes, and there's nothing wrong with having a beautiful home. There's nothing wrong with having a, a landscape yard or a swimming pool or a lot of things, you know. That, but I'm just saying we can't keep those things. Those things are loaned to us, and uh, we're just sojourners. I look back today at the only church directory I have of Mount Vernon Church was 1990. That's been 28 years now. And I, and I saw a lot of pictures in there of people that's no longer with us. They were very important here. How would I ever forget Miss Carolyn McCall's apples? How would I ever forget Miss Margaret Rathman? You weren't officially a year older until she called you. <laughs> when she called you that morning and told, wished you a happy birthday, you knew you were a year older. Well, uh, J.C. Phelps, who personally won World War II, <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> We used to talk about he was Patton's right-hand man and uh, all this stuff, you know. But they're gone. They're gone. I miss them. You know, they're precious people. But we're sojourners. Next year, I may be gone. You may be gone. See, we don't know that. We have no way of knowing that. And then he says in verse 18, for as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold. See, silver and gold, people will kill for it. But they're corruptible. That means they'll tarnish. I've got some silver bullets right now at home because the Lone Ranger is my hero. And I have some silver bullets, but my only problem is they're, they're tarnished. I need them polished up somehow where they'll look like the real thing. And then wear a mask here one night. How... We're not redeemed by silver and gold. How much silver and gold do y'all think it would take to buy you a home in heaven? To live in a subdivision where nobody ever died. Where nobody ever got sick. Where nobody ever felt bad. Where nobody grew older. We couldn't afford that. The Bible says we're not redeemed with silver and gold. By the way, they fluctuate anyway. The value of gold and silver fluctuates. We need something more dependable than that. He says, but by the precious, I've lost my place. I'm going to make this up. Uh, from, from your vain conversation, he says, receive from your fathers, verse eight, uh, 19, by the precious blood of Christ. See, that's how we're redeemed. Now, Peter uses a word that we normally think of as feminine, and that's precious. But don't you call Peter a sissy. He was a fisherman. He was a rugged guy. He would have, he'd probably popped you one if you didn't, but he uses the word precious. That's one of his favorite words. The blood of Jesus is precious. And yet some churches don't even sing about it because it's offensive to the politically correct crowd. They say it's crude. I say our sins were crude. We're, we're redeemed by the precious blood without blemish and without spot. See, that, that had to be. Uh, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world. I don't understand all this stuff, but before the world was ever made, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit sat down together and planned out that if God made man, he knew man would sin. He knew man would, because he had a plan to back it up. Uh, Jesus, the Son, agreed to, to be the substitute for us. See, if Jesus had not been willing to do that, there would be no hope for any of us, because God is perfect holiness. And in order to let you into heaven, you've got to be as holy as he is, and none of us can measure up. But Jesus said, I'll take their place. He did that before the world was ever created. And when Adam and Eve sinned that awful day in the Garden of Eden and God's creation was seemingly messed up, uh, the cross of Christ is not an ambulance racing to a wreck. God already had a plan in place. He had a, a plan. Jesus was foreordained for the foundation of the world. Verse 21, who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. Did you get that? Our faith and hope should be in God, not in the preacher, not in the church, not in the uh, politics, but in God. 
I know my time is up, but I've only got three or four verses here. I'll, I'll run through it as fast as I can. Seeing that you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Very quickly, let me explain the last part of that verse. Unfeigned there is one of my favorite words. It means sincere. It comes from two Greek words. Watch this, sinasira. Sinasira, sincere. It means literally in Greek, without wax. And that sounds stupid, doesn't it? Do you know here's what it means? In olden days, they would have these sculptors. I guess they still do. I'm not an artistic person. But they had people that would make sculptures like Michelangelo and those kind of guys. And they made these sculptures. And sometimes when they made the sculpture, there would be a crack in it. Well, to cover up, the cr you've got two choices. You can either tear the whole thing apart and start over, or you can try to cover up the crack. And the way they covered up the crack was with wax. They, and it sealed it, see, so you couldn't tell it was cracked. So when somebody sold a piece of sculpture in, in ancient times, they would say it is what Sinicera without wax. In other words, this is the genuine article. It doesn't have any wax to it. So our salvation doesn't have any cracks in it that God had to seal up, you know, with flex seal or, or something that would help seal us up. Uh, and then he says, uh, by the way, did you notice the word love is used twice there in that verse? There are two different words in the Greek. See, that's why we have Bible study. You need to know this stuff. There are two different words. That first word, uh, love of the brethren, is, a, is the Greek word phileo, spelled P-H-I-L-E-O. It's where we get the word Philadelphia from. It means brotherly love. We need to love one another in this church as brothers and sisters, right? Right? We got folks here visiting all the way from Cernsey. We need to love them as brothers and sisters. But then there's a second word here, love one another. Uh, I'm sorry, but with a pure heart, I've lost my place. Unfeigned love of the brethren. See that you love one another with a pure heart. That word is agape, spelled A-G-A-P-E, and it means the highest form of love. It means that if we're Christians, we need to love other people even if they don't love us back. If you just love the people that love you, you're no different from the heathens. They do that. Love those who don't love you. That word fervently is an athletic word. It means to strive, to, to work toward a goal. You got a big ball game coming up tomorrow night. Do y'all think these guys have been sleeping all week and resting? They're fervently trying to get to the national championship. There's a goal at the end of it. But it will fade because next year somebody else will be playing. Verse 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. See, that's another reason you can't lose your salvation because you were born again of incorruptible. That will last forever. If we were just born again until we, until we sinned again, we wouldn't last long. By the word of God, folks, we will never understand until we get home how important this book is. And no preacher should ever stand behind the pulpit who does not believe this book. If you don't believe this book, sell insurance. Do something else. You know, try to get you a job somewhere in an office or something. But don't, I, I can't understand why anybody would stand behind the pulpit and not believe the, the Word of God. But according to surveys, we're in big trouble. A lot of preachers, and I'm not just talking about Baptists, I'm talking about preachers in general who, who do not actually believe God's Word to be completely true. They believe some of it, but not all of it. If you're going to believe some of it, but not all of it, how are you going to know which is which? It's either all true or all not true. All right, these are verses here a little bit, uh, a little bit sad, but we need to see it. For all flesh is as grass. That's why, whenever I get to Baxley Banner, I look on that second page, the dreaded obituary page. I don't ever remember getting a Baxley Banner; they didn't have an obituary in it. 
this past week. There were a bunch of them. In fact, I think it took two pages this past week. Uh, sometimes they only have one, one per, but somebody always dying because all flesh is as grass. You know what grass does? It turns green. We mow it all summer. We get out there and sweat and say, boy, I'll be glad when winter gets here and the frost comes and I don't have to get out here and cut this grass. And then the first winter we get, we've, then we're upset because it's cold and we can't wait till summer gets back. But what hap what's happened to y'all's grass, by the way? It's died, had it? Turned brown. Okay, but in the spring, when it warms up again, that grass will, will turn green, but it's temporary. In other words, if you got pretty grass, pretty yard, you'd have it sprayed, cut, but it's temporary. All flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of grass. Old Adolf Hitler boasted and ran and raved that he was going to set up an empire that would last for a thousand years. And Adolf Hitler committed suicide in Berlin on April 30th, 1945, with the Russians about 200 yards away about to break into his bunker. All flesh is as grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. This is sad, isn't it? Because we don't like to think about this stuff. We like to think we'll be here forever. It's what bothers me about these cell phones. One of the most effective cartoons I've ever seen on Facebook showed a family sitting on a couch all the kids were busy with their cell phones and grandma was sitting at the end. And the caption said, one day you're going to look up. Grandma's not going to be there. All flesh is as grass. We're temporary. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. Long after me and Brother Darrell are gone, whether Mount Vernon Church continues to, to prosper or whether you close your doors, but after we're gone, this book will still be true. The word of the Lord will endure forever. Here's what Jesus said about it, Matthew 24, 35. He said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not pass away. The psalmist said in Psalm 119, 89, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Not one jot or one tittle will pass from this book that won't be fulfilled. And by the way, this whole section here is a quote from Isaiah 40, verses 6 to 8. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. How do y'all know you're saved? Oh, I have the, when I get to thinking about it, I have the warm fuzzies. You may have the flu. No, you know you're saved because you, the Word of God says so. Not because I said you were saved. I can't pronounce you saved. The preacher can't pronounce you saved. But God's Word, that's how we know. We did what the Bible says. And this is the Word by which the gospel is preached unto you. All right, so I go eight minutes over time. All right, I've done worse. I was about to move this watch. Remember, it's got to stay right there. That coordinate. Okay. Tomorrow night, Lord willing, here's your homework. It's chapter 2. And like I said now, seriously, I hope you'll come. I do. I, I promise if it gets towards 8 o'clock and I hadn't finished, I'll just stop. Uh, because I understand this is a historic moment for the state of Georgia. Uh who knows whether it'll ever happen again, you know. We, we hope it will, but we, if I'd have told you all last year that Alabama and Georgia would be playing for the national championship next year at this time, you would have thought I was a mental case because in the first place, they don't usually have two teams in the same conference in those playoffs. That's very rare. That probably will never happen again. It's very controversial even this year. But... Uh, I'll, I'll let you out on time. If, if y'all just give me a chance tomorrow night, I'll make up to you for all these long-winded messages I brought at this church. And I'll, I'll let you be there in time to... You, you better get there anyway before 817 because if you're going to watch the National Football League, you'll see players kneeling down, doing all kind of crazy stuff. But as far as I know, in college, they're still saluting the flag. God bless them.
Stand for a word of prayer, please, before I think of something else. Uh, if anybody has any announcements, speak now, forever hold your peace. All right, thank you for coming. Hope you'll come back tomorrow night. Whoever brought me the apple, thank you. Uh, it may be consumed before I get to Graham. But anyway, thank, uh, I'll lead us in a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed. Father, I thank you for this great chapter of 1 Peter. And a lot of times I can study it and study it, but it doesn't sometimes become real until I get here to teach it. I thank you for it tonight, How what a living hope we have that we who are getting older physically, getting weaker physically, uh, we have a hope that the best is yet to come because we have an inheritance that's incorruptible, that's undefiled, and fadeth not away that's reserved in heaven, kept by the power of God. We're going to make it, and I thank you for that. And pray you'll bless us now as we leave, that we'll be safe on the road. In Jesus' name, amen.